we welcome you to this conversation between chaplains and faith leaders about providing leadership and spiritual care in the midst of uh, what is the increase of intimate partner and family violence during COVID-19. Um, I'm Katie givens Time. I'm the Director of Religion and Civic Engagement at Odyssey Impact. Just a quick word if you're wondering who is Odyssey Impact. Odyssey is an interfaith media nonprofit which drives social change through innovative storytelling and media connecting faith and secular communities. And we are also the producers of the film resource series, Healing the Healers, which provides faith leaders and educators with conversations actually that are quite a lot like exactly what we're doing today. Sharing uh, intimate, honest conversations between colleagues about how it really is in the midst of the most difficult spiritual care issues today. Uh, curiously enough, Odyssey was already in the midst of developing a full series for faith leaders and responding to the issues of intimate partner and family violence. And then COVID-19 happened. Um, we wanted to more immediately respond to the dramatic increase in domestic and family violence due to isolation that's occasioned by the pandemic. Um, today, we'll be posting information on our supportive resources for chaplains and faith leaders, especially those um, that are responding to COVID-19 within the chat sections as the discussion continues. We are delighted to co-convene today's live town, town hall with two dear partners of ours, um, Faith Trust Institute and the Association for Clinical Pastoral Education, ACPE. With the increased urgency around this issue, we are really honored to have their partnership along with our esteemed panelists, who I'll introduce quickly, um, who are all working to bring greater awareness of this issue to all faith communities. Today, we want to attend to how two different groups of faith leaders are on the front lines of responding, those of us in congregational settings, and also where we usually know something about the wider family system in which the violence is happening, um, and those of us in chaplaincy situations. Um, perhaps most often the ER, where we're meeting some or all of a violent relational system for the first time. Either way, we know that faith leaders are often receiving reports or observing signs of such violence long before police are ever called. We are so grateful to our panelists today. Imam Mohammed Majid, Reverend Tawana Davis, Dr. Courtney Fisher, Father Charles Dong, and Reverend Amy Gopp. And between these five magnificent humans, they represent a variety of ways of leading this work of helping faith communities better rise to the challenge of attending to intimate partner and family violence. So without further ado, I'm just gonna pose the, the first question. Um, because given Faith Trust Institute's long um, standing uh, position in the, within the faith community, providing resources on this issue, um, and Amy, given um, your position as board chair there, um, we'd love for you to just lay out for us, what is it, what do we mean when we say intimate partner violence and family violence? Could you just give us a definition. Mm -hmm. Well, domestic violence or intimate partner violence um, is a pattern of violent and coercive behavior demonstrated by one adult over another in an intimate relationship. And so often this includes the entire family system because while the violence may be directed towards the intimate partner, um, the children are often a, a part of that, um, witness that abuse and are also traumatized as a result. In fact, 90% uh, of children in houses where domestic violence, intimate partner violence has taken place, where they witness episodes of this violence um, are severely traumatized as a result. And let's be clear, domestic violence can be physical, it can be psychological, verbal, emotional, um, financial, financial control, economic coercion, um, destruction of your property, which could include your beloved pets. Um, this is violence writ large. It is all of those things. And I also want to be clear that domestic violence is always about power and control on the part of the abuser, always. So that's um, the space that Faith Trust Institute has been working in for over 40 years now. Um, and that's how I would define intimate partner violence, which it, again, affects the entire family system. Great, thank you, Amy. Um, the, the next sort of level we wanted to address, and you know, the six of us were talking um, earlier before this meeting, just 
thinking together about how best to provide resources. And um, one thing we really want to communicate is the status of what it is now, the status of intimate partner violence and family violence in COVID-19. Um, and um, uh, Dr. Fisher and Imam Majid, you both are really have been on the ground recently in terms of interacting with um, folks who are in need. And so would love to hear from both of you about sort of give us a landscape of like what it is now. Sure. Imam, would you like to start? Yeah, uh, I will start. Usually I go with the chronological order. Christianity is older than Islam, therefore I ask <laughs> it first. But I will go, I go first, no problem. Uh, Perfect. Uh, it's unfortunately that there's some people are taking advantage of stay home uh, order by showing more of their aggressive, abusive attitude, whether that verbal, or mental, uh, or psychological, or even intimacy, forcing themselves on their spouse, marital, marital rape. Uh, and these uh, people use an excuse of, I've been stressed out, uh, I don't know, I'm gonna lose my job. Uh, and therefore they, they justify their behavior on their loved one because of the stress that they may have from the larger society or because of the circumstances. Therefore, I would like just to say that uh, uh, the uh, people who are going through this difficult time or being uh, staying home, worrying about catching the virus, and then they see this kind of behavior at home where the home does not become a peaceful place, there's no comfort, and there's no pressure, and mental abuse, those are the people who are stuck. Just, but, but when the person being uh, threatened and uh, being uh, subject being subjugated to this kind of abuse, there's many resources still out there. God willing, we'll talk about them later. Everything the mom said is absolutely correct. I think that we've seen, um, to echo what you were saying, it, uh, COVID has become a tool to maintain power and control. Um, so be it um, preventing, if, if you're not in the home with your ab abusive partner and you're attempting to co-parent, um, preventing children from going from one place to another um, doing to, due to COVID. A lot of the courts are shut down, so there's really no recourse. Um, but if you are in the home with an abusive partner um, or spouse, you're really dealing with um, folks who are escalating in physical violence, escalating in psychological abuse, escalating in their spiritual abuse, um, so perhaps controlling um, the grocery shopping so someone is unable to um, get the food that they need to practice um, as they would normally practice. Um, they might um, not be able to get to their rituals or perform their rituals um, because the abusive partner won't allow it or is controlling that process. Um, they may be attempt like we know they might be attempting to control the um, worship, uh, the prayer. Um, you know, we have had a situation. We've uh, worked with someone whose partner was controlling, uh, basically making it unable for them to um, observe Shabbat um, for Friday after from Friday at sundown to Saturday at sundown. Um, and so it's just become another tool for people to use. Um, and as we know, as abusive partners escalate, so as they get stressed out, their behavior also escalates. And so I think that that's what we are seeing as well. Thank you both so much. Um, and to, to Father Dom and to Reverend Davis, um, this and, and all of us can be, be thinking about this, but um, the question we are getting as soon as we are having these conversations with partners and within Odyssey's Faith Network is, um, either, uh, you know, that um, domestic, domestic abuse is something that was part of Pastoral Care 101 in lots of ways, but hasn't been a major focus. There's an awareness that it's bigger now. And so what do, what tools do pastors have? In some ways, they, whether they're chaplains in the ER or whether they're congregational leaders who are seeing folks on, for Zoom church on Sundays, um, they're feeling more restricted, not less, in, in how they can respond. And so what are some thoughts about how, how we can be responsive? Go ahead, Reverend Davis. 
Thank you. Um, I think that, you know, before COVID-19, um, addressing and supporting and advocating for um, victims of domestic violence and domestic intimate partner and family violence in general was challenging enough. Yeah. And now with COVID-19, the tools that we had, um, which was challenging in and of themselves, whether it was num a number to a hotline or having a representative at the church who will be able to guide someone safely um, by not just telling them to leave or why are you staying, someone who is very trained and well-versed in protecting the person and the family and guiding them to particular resources, that was challenging enough. And now that we're not face-to-face, -face, um, we, we have to revamp those safety plans. We have to revamp how we address it. We have to rethink the signs of domestic uh, violence. And uh, one of the things that, um, um, that struck me during this time is the churches, many congregations, not just churches, but many congregations, it was riddled with guilt and shame to talk about this to begin with. So mm -hmm. now I, very few of us are talking about this on our Zoom calls or making sure, you know, people are, are contacted who we may think may be in a domestic violence situation. So to answer your question, the, the tools that were there, the resources that were there um, were, were limited and, and not something that was overtly shared for various reasons, because sometimes you have the abuser and the victim in the same congregation. And then now, with lack of face-to-face, person-to-person, um, we really have an opportunity. I guess a crisis, what I learned in seminary, is a dangerous opportunity. So this is a dangerous opportunity for us to revamp how we deal and address and protect those who are victims of domestic violence, adults and young people alike. Well, I, you know, I totally agree with that. And I think um, we have seen where uh, religious congregations have not been at the forefront in responding to this reality, this problem. Um, a lot of clergy have been ignorant about it or have chosen to close their eyes to it. But it seems uh, during this COVID-19 epidemic or pandemic that there is some attention to domestic violence being um, exacerbated during this time. And that I think is very positive because it's raising the awareness of the problem for many people who weren't even aware of it. And now they're saying, oh yeah, but you know, if you're staying at home and obliged to stay home, you could really be in a difficult place because maybe you're living with uh, a perpetrator or an offender. So I think there's an opportunity here to get the word out. We've known that this has always existed. And now with the COVID-19, it's gotten a little bit more attention and we have to take advantage of that. So I, you know, I think all of our viewers here today are probably on board with us and understand the problem, want to learn more about it. And I think we're all challenged to find different channels in which we can get the information out that there are services, there is help for people who are trapped in their own homes and are suffering or being threatened with abuse. It, they don't have to stay there. They don't have to just submit to this. There's no, like, no way out. There, uh, there are ways out. And so I, that's what we're talking about today. People can find help. Mm -hmm. That's so valuable. And um, it does seem like uh, there's been a rise in, I, I know, um, in teaching in the Christian seminary context in recent years of for pastoral care 101 classes to have students develop a, a short list of all the, the, the major things in their region for calling, calling for help. So for addiction, for all the various pastoral care things there are. Um, would you recommend that um, just any pastor or chaplain in their area just try themselves to reach a resource and see if it's active during COVID? Is that like one, one place to start? I think one of the things that a very simple, if you will, but very powerful thing to do is to list it in your bulletin or however you communicate just National Domestic Violence Hotline, list the number and just that being there when the perpetrator or the one who is um, being abused sees that, 
they see, wow, this congregation is, is possibly supportive and they've given me a resource and I can call this number when I have a moment or I can sneak in, you know, in the bathroom on my cell phone and then delete the number because there are so many layers to this, right? Where if I hand someone something and then the perpetrator gets hold of it, that might aggravate the abuse. Like, what are you doing? Who are you calling? So if it's just there for general consumption, mm -hmm. then I think that that's an easy, not easier, but uh, a safer way to disseminate the information. Something as simple as putting it in your weekly um, bulletins or email or whatever it might be. And, and, al and also talking about it, breaking the silence. This is that opportunity to do that because we have not been good. And in, in my um, experience, we did not learn about this as we should have in seminary. We are not trained. It is very clear from all the stats that pastors, clergy, faith leaders, imams, rabbi, we have not been trained and we are ill-equipped to see the signs of abuse and then to respond to them. So this is an opportunity to break that silence and not only to do so in, write, you know, in writing, but speak from the pulpit or now through the screen, however it is that you are reaching your congregations, talk about it. And that seems so simple, but it is so, so important and so powerful. So yeah. break the silence around this. Say also yeah. that April is Sexual Assault Awareness Month. Um, and so that gives you a fairly good in to have this conversation. Um, we, Jakita has um, signs in all of the bathrooms that um, allow us to put up signs. Um, every stall, not men's and women's. Um, and uh, I think that's a great I, that's a great tool in a normal scenario. This is not a normal scenario. So I like uh, Reverend Davis's idea. Um, but the National Domestic Violence Hotline, I just want to um, tout that again, that will route you to your local provider. Yes. So you can call there and, you know, if you're calling from Chicago, Illinois, it's going to route you to oh. Um, your provider is in Chicago, Illinois. So it's not going to give you, you know, you're not going to be in a far off place. Um, and I, I think that is a good resource to, to help. I think another part of this is that a lot of people are in an abusive relationship and they don't even recognize that that it is mm -hmm. abusive and they're not going to call it domestic violence or mm -hmm. abusive, but it is. And they may just be in a difficult situation and they should call that hotline because they can just talk it over with somebody yeah. and help reflect on what is happening in their lives and get a little bit of advice. You know, it's not going to, it's free. It's without obligation. It's confidential. It's wonderful uh, that you're able to get this kind of uh, counsel and direction. Yeah, but, I, but also uh, I think it's uh, extremely important for the clergy and chaplains to provide guidance from their own text for the congregant online about the various type of abuse and how they can protect themselves from it and how they can create a peaceful home. Because the problem here uh, I can see uh, with COVID-19, it is not uh, only the physical uh, abuse, or very clear verbal abuse, but also mental abuse. Mm -hmm. For example, in some, uh, you know, I, I heard from a particular country or culture have asked their women to, to look beautiful all the time for their husband, to appease their husband, to make them happy during COVID-19 because the husband is staying home. What kind of a message are you giving to somebody daughter, somebody wife, to, uh, to tell them that your goal is to serve the man who feeling bored and is staying home and so that you entertain him. That is really a wrong message, a wrong message to be given. But what can we do in, in terms of uh, addressing the issue of uh, uh, control in terms of service? That people want to be served and someone like to sit like a king or sometimes a queen <laughs> uh, to be served and other people just uh, 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 adhere to their, their needs or look for after the need without them being participant in serving others. But I think we should 
uh, I, 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 I like what uh, you know uh, Dr. Fisher was saying about about the bathroom, putting things in the bathroom. But today, there's everyone saying they're on bathroom. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you, you don't go to the mosque or the synagogue or the church. What we need to do is that in after every sermon or virtual talk, we remind people of these issues. Mm-hmm. And we tell them where they can go for help. And then we talk about what it looks like to have a peaceful, healthy relationship so that people can figure it out. Because many people are listening now, more than dollars. My classes are more people online than before. Before it is the time for me to tell them there's a, something called verbal abuse, it's spiritual abuse, mental abuse, uh, you know, uh, even people shock that I talk about marital rape. Like, like you a Muslim imam, there's nothing like that. I said, no. The Prophet peace of him said, if you force yourself on your spouse, that's violating the principles of Islam. You look like an animal. That's what he said. He used the word animal. Therefore, it's very important for us to, uh, to address the taboo also of certain things people have never heard of. This is a time for us to talk about them. It's also a great time to, to map the community resources if you have not done so already. And I think that's another piece, whether you're a chaplain or pastor, priest, imam, rabbi, whatever, you, I think, are responsible as a leader in your faith community to, to, to map those resources, to refer, 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 to remember your role as a faith leader, to be clear about that, and then make the proper you know, referrals. So to know the shelters, what are your shelter resources? Uh, what are the hotlines? I would also lift up in, in addition to the, because it's easier, it may be easier to text right now and, and a text to love is one word to 22522 doesn't make a sound. You can text a lot easier than calling even sometimes. Um, that's the domestic violence hotline, which also is available in 200 languages, by the way. So that's helpful mm-hmm. for you communities, no matter wow. how you speak. Mm-hmm. Um, but to map your other resources, legal expertise, medical expertise, law enforcement, have a sense of your own community. In our community here in Ohio, we have something called Someplace Safe, which allows you to chat also, um, not without, you know, without making a sound. Look and see what's available. There are federal grants available, but you have to do the research in your own region, your own community to know what those are. And I think that's the responsibility of the faith leader, um, regardless of what what venue you serve. It seems like it's also important to remember that whether you're a chaplain in the hospital or um, a law enforcement official, or um, whether you are, um, you ha- you've known a family for a while, they seem like they're struggling, that reaching out to the resources yourself and getting some advice is great. Mm-hmm. Talking to colleagues, just like you would about a bunch of other things, um, it, even that can feel a little nerve wracking because to name that something is happening, to name that domestic assault is happening um, in, within your congregation or that as a chaplain, did you miss it? Did it come in and out of the ER and did you miss it? You know, that, that can be just a huge weight too. So reaching out to colleagues is just enormously important. And I wanted to just ask um, sort of along the lines of, of mapping resources, um, uh, Dr., Dr. Fisher, would you just name the family court situation? You were, you were sort of laying that out really well. Sure. So um, the court situation is definitely going to be dependent on the area in which you are in. Um, So be mindful of that. Uh, Your local domestic violence provider will probably know this very intimately, but you can also call the court. In an emergency, um, and most courts are operating in an emergency right now, they're going to do protective orders um, for domestic violence, um, and they're going to do uh, bail hearings. nothing else. So um, right now what we're seeing in the greater DC area, which is where uh, Jakeda operates, is that the courts are issuing uh, very long-term temporary protective orders. Um, The issue with those is that nothing else is open. So if someone um, has violated a custody agreement, if someone has violated an alimony agreement, Um, the family court systems, the custody hearings are not happening. Um, So, and the the abusers know that. So I wanna echo my colleagues here talking about the power and control. They know that. They know that they're not gonna be held accountable. Um, And they also know that when the courts do reopen, there's going to be a significant backlog. 
Um, that doesn't mean all hope is lost. <laughs> um, there are, are, I would bet that in your communities, the domestic violence service providers are open. Um, and they are seeing clients, they are taking clients, they are taking people into shelter. Um, so just be mindful and, and th those attorneys that were working before are working now. Um, so there are attorneys that do not in your communities and that do nothing but um, domestic violence protective orders and work with intimate partner violence and sexual assault victims. Um, so definitely reach out to them. Um, like Reverend Gopp was saying, do your um, survey of what's available and those people can help give you critical information. I would also bet that it's on their website right now. <laughs> Most of us have put stuff on our website, done webinars and put them on our website uh, as a service provider, which is what we are. Um, and so for people to be able to access and we update them all the time. You know, I think another thing that's real important is for people to realize that during this time, a lot of hotels have opened up rooms yes. to increase the capacity of shelters. Yes. Well, shelters are almost always full and it's hard to find a bed or mm -hmm. a room or a, a person or a family, you know, with children. But uh, I know in Illinois, um, there are a lot of hotels that have opened up and the state mm -hmm. is providing funding not only for the housing of people uh, who are fleeing uh, abuse in their own homes, but also providing food and transportation. So uh, there are a lot of things that are available in this particularly mm -hmm. difficult time. And if I can just offer, I just want to name my, um, how I'm showing up in this call, not only as a, a reverend and not only as a former chaplain, but I am a domestic violence survivor. And all of, I am here because of, you know, the national hotlines, the, the support groups, the private support groups, the safety plans, the village that I had surrounding me when I couldn't go anywhere alone. Um, so these are things that work. Is it easy? No, it, we may make it seem easy because it's just, we know this stuff and we support um, people who are victims of domestic violence, but the, just trust the process. And it is a long process, which unfortunately we find people go back because they find that it's easier just to go back mm -hmm. to deal with what they know than to go and expose themselves to what they don't know. So I'm just here as a representative of following these, these things that these support, supportive measures that are in place that work. Thank you, thank you so much for that. That's, thank, thank you for Reverend sharing you. that. And thank you for your presence and your work. And, and if, just to follow up on that, so when you think about a, the, a COVID perspective and you think about um, your experience um, of abuse and what, you, what you, you would still say loud and clear, follow the process, it will take, it will be slower and it will be harder to manage, but don't not follow it. Don't not, I mean, that's what I'm hearing. Yes. Yes, it's it's it, before COVID nineteen. It, it was a, a daunting process. So, I, and not to laugh at all because it's not funny. Um, no. But in no. this moment, um, that I I spoke to a few shelters in this area, and they are still open. They're still pro pro uh, providing counseling. They're still, you know, if you don't have family members, because it's if it's not safe for me and I'm a victim, it's not safe for my family and friends either but it's the shelters and the support groups that are gonna guide you and tell you where to go, safe places you can stay, who can be your support system. So yes, 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 follow and trust mm -hmm. the process. The key is that you remain safe and out of harm's way of someone that wants to have power and control and, how, and now has lost that power and control if you, if you leave, but you'll gain your life versus risking your life every day. And I want to follow up with, on what Reverend Davis is saying. Um, leaving an abusive situation is the most dangerous part, uh, is the most dangerous point in that relationship. Um, and any domestic violence service provider can help you to safety plan. Um, on Jakeda's website, which I know has been shared, there is a webinar that you can watch. Uh, it's called Safety Planning in a Quarantine. And our intention in doing was helping people figure out how they can be safe when they are quarantined with their abuser. I don't, I don't want to encourage people to just leave without a plan. Um, 
because that can be more dangerous for them as everyone on this uh, call knows. So thank you, Reverend Davis, for mentioning safety. Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. And I'd love to hear just um, other stories of, you know, from you being on the front lines, especially given the online context of this, um, what things have worked? What, what have been your experiences? Um, well, <laughs> uh, it changes every day, um, but uh, we have had a lot of support from the community as folks are saying here. So, um, for example, a close partner of Jakeda's in the greater DC area is Catholic Charities. Catholic Charities has um, excellent immigration resources. Um, so they can work with folks if the undocumented or might have immigration questions or concerns. Um, so that, that is a helpful resource. Um, we uh, work on helping people to find a friend that they can have a code word with. Um, so for example, if you're, in a, if you're in a small community, you walk to your place of worship, um, you know, you might have a friend next door or across the street, you can call that per you can talk to that person and say, you know, if I call you and say the word bread, um, can you just come over to the house um, and maybe disrupt whatever is happening there? If I call you and say the word car, um, can you please just call 911? Um, so that kind of, that's a, that's kind of a code to disrupt if something becomes violent or out of control. So that has worked. Um, you know, Father Dom mentioned hotels. We actually had two, a retreat center and a hotel email us and say, we'll open, we'll open up space oh. for clients. Um, and, you know, one is, um, I don't know if you're familiar with the greater DC area, but one said, we'll, get, we'll do it for $60 a night, which is outrageous. <laughs> I mean, that's so low uh, in the DC area. Um, and it's a fairly nice hotel in a very nice area of town. So that would be so helpful. Um, I bet you, like Father Dom said, there are other hotels doing that and that is helpful. Um, one thing is that uh, faith leaders are going to see the abuse um, before the police will by far, particularly congregational faith leaders who are seeing the whole family system. Um, so if someone has all of a sudden dropped off of Bible study or Torah study or on worship services, reach out um, and find out what's going on. Um, if somebody is acting more anxious than usual, um, it could be COVID, um, but it also could be something really terrible is happening in the house. Um, so I would just reach out and see how that person is doing. Um, the thing is, is that a lot of partners are not going to blink if, they're, if they're, the abused person is calling their rabbi or their reverend or their imam because they want them to participate in those. So, um, you know, you're a resource and as long as you're able to respond in a, um, a non to way, which, you know, and, and you're able to connect with resources, that would be really helpful. Others of you, just things uh, you've learned. Uh, I, I just want to say that there have been repeated so many times, uh, people have said physical distancing, being physical, mm -hmm. A physical distance does not mean social isolation uh, because one of the problem of domestic violence a problem everything of the domestic violence is a problem but one of the major uh, sign of domestic violence is social isolation that a person who's been abused been isolated uh, from others now uh, I would like to recommend that the chaplains and the imams and the ministers and the priests and Rabbi, all of them to tell people that keep connected with people, connect with people, especially people who have the history of being in, in the cycle of whether verbal abuse or mental abuse. Mm -hmm. And here are the suggestions that keep uh, a, a routine of connecting with the family with Zoom or with phone. If they, they realize that you have not been called for two days, three days, and then check on you and they say, what's happening? Therefore, that is very important. The other aspect of this, you can create a support group in your community, a virtual support group on domestic violence, and that people can know once a week can log into this group and they can get the support they need, that somebody is going to check on them and so forth. So people can 
uh, can be able to uh, to come in touch with, with this group. The third point I want to make is that as we counsel people on and, and, and the phone, and some of them, uh, they may not be fluent in English. Mm -hmm. They may not have the resources, even uh, internet access, they only have the cell phone. They have to be able to connect them to somebody I, you know, in the community or somebody can be able to help them to go through the process. Because if we don't have the, all the resources or you don't have a local organization that help us, we can use member of our community that we, like in my community, have mental health providers that we trust them, 10 of them, and they being subsidized by our mosque. Those are the people with no confidentiality. They will not violate the confidential uh, person because people providing the service has to be trained. Otherwise, if a member of the community does not have no training, they might violate the, the confidentiality and the privacy of that person to be a problem, another problem. But we would like to see how can we utilize the resource in our community to help people going through a difficult time, even to, uh, to make um, uh, a phone call, to help them have where to, to you know, uh, to go to uh, uh, to ask for protective order. For it, it is very important for us to create a sense of community at this time. The last thing I want to say, we have to be careful of the spiritual abuse come from clergy. What I mean by that, do not tell a woman, especially talking about women, because most of the cases of domestic violence are women who have been abused. Don't tell the woman be patient. Let the COVID-19 over, this is not the right time to talk about this. Please don't give them that reflection. That is wrong. That we have to stand strong with them, and we have not to tell them, be patient now, wait until this is over, God is testing you. God is not just testing the clergy, <laughs> he's testing me to stand for her, not testing her. Therefore, it is very important that you have a very firm language. First, to acknowledge the pain of the person, to believe them, and then to direct them to right resources, not to second guess them, not to tell them this is not the right time to talk. That all nonsense talk, we should not do that. <laughs> I just be very frank. If what, that would be a spiritual abuse for me as a clergy on that person. I think that is so helpful. Yes, yes, yes. To uplift the narratives that sneak into our various spiritual doctrines and theologies, um, to, to name the ways that it can happen. Um, I hope everyone is noticing there's just an amazing wealth of comments and questions and really great insights in the chat. So um, be sure to, to take a look as, as um, this goes goes on. Um, one question specifically for you, Reverend Gopp, um, rural access, access to rural resources. We've happened to mention in our various contexts, different um, urban contexts and um, things you can get in cities, but um, some folks are asking about access in rural areas. I think it's it's pretty clear that no matter where you are, there's the, in our county, for example, the, the domestic shelter, the domestic violence shelter is, is still working as Courtney, it, it, we are still on call. Advocates are available um, by phone, by text, in all the ways that um, virtually have um, that people can reach out in an anonymous fashion. It's all still available. Um, the court system is not working in the same way as we've already discussed, but um, pr for the most part, the resources in terms of the shelter and the faith community, it's absolutely critical because you may be a little bit more isolated that you as a faith leader is reaching out. That's probably the most important point that it's on me. The onus is on me as the Imam said to reach out and make sure that I am in contact with everybody in my parish, in my congregation. That is to up to me to make sure. Mm -hmm. And especially when we're feeling such social isolation, to remind them that they are not alone, that God is with them, right? As people of faith, God is, they're not alone. That God is with them, God is for them, that I am with them as their faith leader, and I am able to help them access the resources that they may not be able to, to access themselves. Um, but they're still available here too. And to make that clear, as we talked about, breaking that silence, talking about it, lifting it up over and over and over again and making sure that it is absolutely central to, to whatever messages I'm writing or speaking, preaching, that it is clear. 
if you, but be prepared when you talk about it, you will hear about it. When you talk about this, you will hear about this. So as a faith leader to be prepared for how you will then accompany that, that person. I want to thank, that's perfect. Thank you so much. And uh, I want to, I want to lift up also something that's come up in a couple ways, but how can faith narratives be harmful and hurtful? So Reverend Gop just named, naming that God is with you and God is for you is actually not a, not a given when it comes to situations where someone's suffering abuse. They may have been told the opposite. So this is open to any of you. Just how can faith narratives harm and hurt, harm, harmful and helpful? I, I would say I'm, I will go first because I'm the one non-faith leader here. Um, so I will just um, say what I've heard and seen is that Abusers like to use um, your text, um, where that text is, to justify um, the behavior and the abuse and staying in the marriage. Um, and I, we work in a lot of interfaith spaces um, at Jakeda, and I have not heard one uh, leader say that their text should be um, interpreted that way. So I would say to be very mindful that there are folks out there that are there when the victim comes to you, they are being told that the text justifies the abusive behavior. Um, and so you just kind of be, you know, the first thing you can say is um, God uh, does not want this. This is not in our text. This is not in the Quran. This is not in the Torah. This is not in the Bible. Um, that would be my first thought. You know, I, I have a, an example very quickly when I was going through, um, um, my, my spouse's, the domestic abuse with, with my spouse, um, Reverend Lavanya McIntyre in seminary, I will never forget we were having a group conversation not related to domestic violence. And I had just recently found out that I was a victim of domestic violence. And she said to me, don't let the Bible be the belt that beats you. So in other words, use that Bible because the spiritual abuse is real, right? And we see scriptures about rape, about war, about all of these things. And, and sometimes as a, a victim, you begin to question like, where is God in all of this? So she met me where I was and created a space for me to safely share my story. And then she said, there are some scriptures that are going to be affirming and we are gonna focus on those affirming scriptures right now. We know that the totality, right, of the, of the, the holy text, but that right now for this moment, you need to be affirmed, you need to be fed, you need to be protected, you need to be encouraged, you need to be empowered. So don't let the Bible be the belt that beats you. Very good, yeah. Well, I, I think that that's absolutely true, but there's also a kind of, natural sense of guilt like well i chose this man and he's my spouse and i'm responsible uh, i screwed up so there is a tendency for people to blame themselves for the abuse that they're receiving or somehow or other they did something that provoked it all of which we know is not the case because nothing justifies power and control over another person even though the person may have made some mistakes so we have to help people understand that guilt is not helpful in this, but rather to feel that you are loved by God. If you know there is no justification for this abuse, and we want to help you to understand and feel the mercy and compassion and presence of God in your life, that you can experience His love for you, because in your relationship you are not experiencing that. I'd like to say a few things here. Um, there's a few problems that, uh, you know, with, with, with using of the text, you know, in this issue. One is the issue of gratitude. I heard uh, religious uh, husbands telling their wife, you're not showing gratitude to God. I have, you have a roof above your head. I've been giving you food. Even if I hit you slam once in a while, you forget all of that. You know, misusing gratitude, like you are not grateful enough mm -hmm. to what I have also I've been feeding you. She's not a, 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 an animal. Even animal, you're not allowed to abuse animal. You know, uh, 
but a person using this kind of language, and not only that some clergy sometimes use this language, just be grateful. You know, there's other women uh, don't have what you have. Thank God you have a car. Thank God you have a house. That's nonsense. Gratitude. They use also the, the, the uh, it's God will. God have willed this God for you. you are you going to get going again as God will? That's, that's what God decreed for you. Just be patient with that. That's un, unacceptable. The third issue is stigma of divorce. You know, divorce, does, God doesn't like divorce. God hate divorce. Therefore, do not break your marriage. Don't break uh, and give them that guilty. Number four, that, you know, you would be held accountable because you make your children a divorce, a children of divorced parents. They put all the, the blame and the guilt for the person asking out of abusive, abusive relationship. That is unacceptable. That is really spiritual abuse to the maximum. For we have to empower people and to tell them there's no human being that can come between you and God. You see, God direct relationship between you and God and do not allow a man, I'm going to say a man, I'm sorry, I have five daughters, I have to protect them, that, that interpret religion for you in a way that monopolize it and to tell you that he is the, you know, he's your uh, uh, appointed protector by God. Yeah, I tell him, you know, this is not acceptable. If you are really a protector, you will not have abused me. You have not, uh, uh, you know, uh, hurt me. Because they, they use the protector. That means I'm going to protect you. That's why I'm asking you to obey me in this way. I'm asking you to, uh, uh, to respond to my uh, you know, physical intimacy need. I'm asking you not to leave the house at this time. And that, you know, those kind of control that people use this a beautiful concept of protections mm -hmm. become control. And, and that is the misuse of language because there's a particular language that we use in Islam that people misusing it uh, in, in Arabic that they use the throw those, you know, terminologies on someone to shut them, uh, you know, have them not to, to be able to uh, respond to them. I want to say here, Peaceful Family Project have, have done a training for Muslims, uh, imams and chaplains during this COVID-19, how to deal with, with, how to lead the community in difficult time. And we did talk about domestic violence uh, in, on those uh, webinars. Excellent. Thank you so much. I wanted to also pose um, a question that's also come up in the, in the comments. Um, we know in the news um, that uh, there's a lot of concern because um, those who would be reporting observed uh, child abuse and neglect are no longer in those roles, that there are, that the reporting has gone way down in terms of child neglect and abuse, but um, that doesn't add up with what um, first responders and others are seeing. So how do we stay connected to the full family and to vo other vulnerable members outside of an intimate relationship where there's violence? How do we stay connected to the needs of children and other vulnerable fo folks in these family units? It's a tricky one. Yeah, it is a tricky one. It's 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 very difficult. Well, I you know, it, to the extent that we have communication with, uh, you know, our members of our congregations, uh, if we have that communication, we can be giving out information about the risk that children are running right now, and talk to them about. I mean, this is Sexual Abuse of Children Month, and um, you know, we I just put a. A, a, a homily on our website about sexual abuse of children. And I know how difficult it is in families to recognize it and then do something about it besides, uh, apart from sweeping it under the carpet. So um, how damaging this is, how frequent it is, how damaging it is, many people don't know. So if we can hold that up to people that th this is also a heightened problem that is uh, un unquestionably aggravated during this period of time, and we have to be particularly vigilant and responsive to it to protect our children. I know that we have to get that message out. However, we might be able to do that. Yeah, it, 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 for me, it's very important that uh, to think about the following thing. Number one, if we have to uh, tell adults that if a child 
in a home come to complain to you about another adult. That's right. You have to believe them. Yeah. You take all the measures to protect that child. That's number one uh, advice. Number two is that um, the uh, to reduce amount of uh, exposure that you have to be careful to uh, uh, not to allow strangers who stay in your home or even uh, adults that you might think that have a behavior that is not acceptable to be with the children alone. The other thing that if a child said, I'm not comfortable to be hugged this way, I'm not comfortable, even at this time, then we give them a space. Give them a space. We have to teach the, 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 uh, our community those basic principles of creating, even at this time, I'm saying husband and wife, if wife said, I, I don't like to have intimacy, husband cannot force himself into her, okay? Uh, the, it's very important for us to talk about golden rules. If it doesn't feel good, don't do it to them. If the person said, I'm not comfortable with it, back off, period. Right. Golden rule for everybody in the house. The, the last things I want to say that, in some culture, they had a problem of acknowledging, for example, a grandfather or an uncle can have that kind of behavior. And they get so mad with the children when bringing it up. They say, how dare you accuse your grandfather? How dare you accuse your uncle? How do you accuse this person or that person? You have to be careful because I'm going to tell you, share with you, that some children have committed suicide mm -hmm. because no one was listening to them. They thought they, the only way to deal with the pain because they could not complain about it, yeah. shut down. Absolutely. Their own life. Therefore, it's very dangerous. Thank you for this that. question. So right. uh, I'm, yes, I'm sorry, just one other thing I thought mm -hmm. about as, as everyone was adding so much value to that question. Um, in, in areas that are marginalized, um, impoverished, don't have internet, um, don't have all of these resources that are deemed luxuries but are actually necessities nowadays. Um, even teachers are, or, or doctors are, they cannot do what they would normally do when they're interacting with children because families don't have internet for telehealth where I can actually see my doctor, my doctor can see me, and then at least you can see some physical signs, whether it's psychological, emotional, or physical. So, you know, the, the disparaging um, approaches here um, is, is very challenging in, in those marginalized areas that don't have access to the things that we're, we're discussing. So here is another opportunity for us to really the churches or congregations and mosques to, to really tap into those families when they can, how they can, as Imam eloquently stated, stated, even with the phone call, relational, get to know your family. So when you hear that change in their voice or the avoidance, it, it goes off. You, it, there's something that triggers that says, okay, something is not right. But without the relationship, um, with all of the other missing parameters of not having the internet or access or money and think the list goes on and on and on. The relational piece is so important so that you can pinpoint or at least recognize when things are going awry or astray and be able to ask the right questions or point them in a different direction. So valuable, thank you. I just wanna ask one sort of wrap up question. I wanna be respectful of everybody's time. We have about five minutes left. Um, in thinking about um, full families, healthy families, safe, families and thinking about safe households in, in COVID-19. Um, what are some last words you would have for both chaplains and, and uh, hospital law enforcement, various contexts, and also um, faith leaders in congregational contexts? How do we, what are some phrases, some um, tools to um, helping folks think about safe family units? Well, you know, one thing that hasn't been touched upon and, and that we're pretty focused on is prevention and how are we going to stop this? Uh, in Chicago, the mayor has set up a domestic violence planning committee and its focus is change the culture, 
And one of the things about changing the culture about domestic violence is getting to young people. So how are we going to get this into our youth groups, our schools, so that uh, children who are learning these patterns, so often abusive, from very early age, I'm talking about fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh grade, that they begin on how to form and recognize healthy and unhealthy relationships. And we have the opportunity to do that now because the CDC has come out with a curriculum that we can implement in our congregations and in our schools. Um, to, thank you, for Father Don, for mentioning that. Jaquita has a program that right now is fourth grade through um, college. It's age appropriate, healthy dating violence, and we um, make it hey. culturally adaptable. Um, so whichever space we're in, be it a religious school or a public school, um, we can make that happen. And on the Jakeda website, there is a webinar on teen dating violence. That's kind of a step one. Um, we, we pushed it out for parents who might be looking for content to keep their kids busy. Um, but it, um, it talks about teen dating violence and what it is. Um, we have had tons of kids, teen, teenagers, adolescents, um, come up to us after a workshop and say, you know, this happens in my house. Um, and I didn't realize what it was. Um, and so not only is it teaching them skills for healthy relationships, um, but it is also helping them to recognize what is going on in their house. From the United Church of Christ perspective, um, we have a curriculum called Our Whole Lives or OWL. And it is a joint Unitarian Universalist and United Church of Christ curriculum, which is open to anybody and certainly um, available to, to, to people, certainly from the Christian tradition, but um, would be applicable to, to people of any faith. And so I would lift that up in addition to, of course, all of the resources and training that Faith Trust Institute offers. And I believe that um, the Faith Trust um, website has been um, in the chat box here. And mm -hmm. also, I would encourage everybody to take advantage of those those resources. Yeah, I would say the same thing that we have Peaceful Family Project resources there to get help to family. And I just want to say I was proudly the former, one of the former uh, member of the board of Faith Trust Institute that uh, where they produce all of this uh, uh, videos, DVDs for the Muslim communities and very great resources that all chaplains can go to Faith Trust Institute and get that uh, toolkit about uh, addressing the Muslim violence in the Muslim community. It is so fantastic that you say that um, on our last minute because you're transitioning perfectly into me saying just two things, which is one, just to state the obvious, there are so many complex layers here. Y'all have done an amazing, beautiful, sincere job of lifting those up. We know there could be many more. Um, to answer folks in the in the chat, yes, we will absolutely be sending a, a conference, uh, an email out. There'll be a recording of this session, and also we'll include the links that have been um, lifted up here. And also, we want to say that um, on September 1st, um, we will be um, releasing the second series of Healing the Healers, which will focus on intimate partner and family violence. And so we look forward to really having even more time to really in-depth explore these things in that resource. So we are ending on time. Always, it's always a great thing to end on time. <laughs> but um, a sincere thanks to all five of you. Thank you so much. And thank you to all the participatory um, chatters and attendees. And um, we look forward to um, um, more spiritual care focused um, um, things coming soon. So thank you all. Thank, thank you. Bye for now. Thank you. Thank you.